We are uh, we are assembled. <clears throat> Avengers. 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 Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> yeah. This is the second to last panel of the uh, of the weekend. Yeah, if we do um, it, long, it could be the last. The the last one is going to be at the pavilion, uh, at three o'clock. Uh, that is what's going on with Robert E. Howard, and then from there we'll uh, sign releases and head out to the to the barbecue. But this is Robert E. Howard in Texas. Uh, I am. The guy that seems to have been here all weekend. Uh, <laughs> I'm Mark Finn. Uh, with me is uh, uh, surprise guest Joe Lansdale, uh, Paul Herman, and Rusty Burke. And uh, we are all here because we think Robert E. Howard and Texas go together like bacon and eggs. Um, does uh, do, do I need an opening thesis statement? Why uh, not? Um, or not? Or, or not? Sure. No. Uh, Why not? I don't think. Uh, you have to be Texan to get Robert E. Howard, but I think it's impossible to be a Texan and not get him. If you, especially if you read him uh, with, with with that kind of open, you know, if you start looking for Texas and Robert E. Howard, you're going to find it, and you're going to find it not just in the westerns, uh, and not necessarily even in the characters, because a lot of his characters, you know, Sailor Steve Costigan is from Galveston. Uh, the entire Elkins clan lives in Bear Creek, Nevada, but they're all from Texas. Uh, El Barak is from Texas. Uh, you know, he's got he's got a number of uh, characters that are Texan, but the themes that he writes about, the the stories and the settings that he um, uh, appropriated to create uh, some of his stories. Uh, the the language, the tall tale, the, the style of storytelling, it's all Texan. And um, uh, the first year I brought Kathy out here, she was not yet Mrs. Finn. She was uh, Kathy, my girlfriend. And uh, I, this is always one of those litmus tests. You bring her, you bring the you bring the wife or the to be or the girlfriend out, and if they can handle Howard days, you know you've got a keeper. Uh, and so we were driving back, and, and I said, so what would you think? She said, that was really fun. You know, I, I like small town stuff. This is great. And uh, she kind of paused, and she said, so, so, so let me get this straight. Robert E. Howard is a Texan, right? I said, yep. Uh, born here, lived here, died here, wrote about stuff. And she says, well, honey, I'm a Texan. I said, yeah. She says, how come I didn't know him? That's a great question. And it's a, 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 one of the things that got me, I, I, I credit her for being the person that kind of put me on that, that research path for what ultimately became Blood and Thunder, you know? Um, and, 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 I, and I know, and you being, a this is, you've got a perspective on this because, you know, uh, not only are you a Texas writer, but you know other Texas writers. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a chasm between Texas literature and you guys that write mysteries. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. What, why, why is there that? Because it seems like you, you're, you're, you're lionized in, in Italy. Uh, Howard translate two dozen languages and counting. Um, the, you know, um, uh, Rick Reardon stuff, uh, mm -hmm. widely read. Uh, probably more people have read uh, Robert E. Howard than, than Catherine Ann Porter. And yeah. yet Catherine Ann Porter, who didn't even like Texas, is the one that people hold up and go, well, she's a real Texas author. Why do you think that is? I think a lot of it really just has to do with going back to the pulps. And when you look at the pulps, uh, they were not considered literature. And, and maybe on, in one sense they're not classic literature, and in another sense, they may be even more classic literature. And by that, I mean that we have classic literature that's academic. And then we have classic literature that comes out of mythology and that comes out of pure storytelling. And it's very much, although there's certainly influences that Howard had, I relate to Howard a whole lot because, uh, you know, like I said, I don't hold him in reverence because that's just not how I am, but I hold him in respect. And what I hold about him is that he grew up like I did in a very small Texas town. I was, mine was East Texas. But I was different in my interest and things like that. So I, I kind of get where he's coming from. I grew up with a great fan of mythology and things like that. I grew up poor. My father couldn't read or write. Uh, 
you know, the uh, great people, but, uh, and, and they always encouraged me and stuff, but people around me, they were like, well, what's that old writing stuff? Do you, do you go, you make a book and then sh you, you walk around door to door and send it? And, <laughs> no, it doesn't work like that. And, and then people would come in, because my mother now was a reader, and they'd come into the house and we'd have books and, and shelves and stuff like that. And I remember one lady, it was Kenda somehow, I don't remember, she came and said, what do y'all do with all them books? My mom said, well, we stack them up and stand on them. Because <laughs> it really, and you know, she was really somebody that you hardly, but that got her right there. I mean, because yeah. every time somebody comes in, she says, do you read these? You know, yeah. and I mean, yeah, it's that, just, that snarl. especially then, and, and actually our bookshelf was, you know, by modern standards, by what I have, I have like 20,000 books or something, counting magazines, and I've donated some things, so maybe it's, it's less than that now. But, but the point is, is that we used to have a shelf that was about the size of this quilt, mm -hmm. and it was, you know, I had four or five rows of books, and, and part of that was the encyclopedias and uh, the dictionary, in which I read World Book Encyclopedia from A almost to Z. I didn't quite make it. But because I had nothing else to read, I would read Salt Shaker, I, anything I would see when I was a kid, I would read it because I, I was hungry for it. And comic books led to me getting more and more, more interested in it. And then I actually discovered Howard through Pigeons from Hell, which was a, on a show called Thriller, which I actually saw it when it was new. That's even scarier to me. And, uh, but, so all of these things were there, but I think, and I'm trying to tie this into your liter literary question, mm -hmm. I just don't think these kind of things are easily answered. Yeah. And uh, it had such a primal effect on me. Now, I have to admit, I much prefer stylistically Steinbeck, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, I mean, I'm not kidding you, that's it. That's uh, the way I am, Ray Bradbury. But the, the thing that, that Howard had was he had this pure storytelling art. It, it didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, he read and listened. But if you grew up in Texas, and I'm assuming it's very much the same way here as it was in East Texas, people had stories. And we used to sit out under a tree and people would tell stories. And there is a rhythm of storytelling that I recognize in Howard that goes with the same rhythm of storytelling I have. And people often notice that Howard's an influence in some of my stuff, especially the weird westerns, but we don't write anything alike, but we tell stories alike. The stories are pure, raw, BS stories that we heard growing up, <laughs> mixed with real stories, mixed with all the oil field workers, and you know, my, my dad rode the rails and boxed and wrestled and, and all that. So all of these things that Howard writes about, even if he didn't do them all, he probably knew people that did or claimed they did. And so his ear was attuned to that. So the, what really makes him work is the rhythm of the storytelling. That's what everybody misses. It's not the words. He's, he's not always that great a writer. I've but always said that. I've always said he's a very oral storyteller. He very is. He's, it, it, and, and he can be poetic, though, but he's poetic like my dad, who was illiterate, was, was poetic. He, could, he, had a, he had a rhythm of voice and poetry yes. that affected, affects the way I talk now. It affects the way uh, I write. And it, what people are missing is this is what makes Howard Howard. And because there are a lot of people that wrote as well or better, but they, they came from a constipated, <laughs> sort of development of story where Howard had diarrhea. I mean, when he sat down, that stuff just flowed out and he was living it. Cause my, my wife will say, you know, you're talking to yourself in there. And I remember when I saw uh, the whole wide world where it was talking and, and I read the, uh, uh, you know, the book it was based on, I thought I'd do that. Yeah. And that's because we come from this oral tradition. And when my parents would tell me, said, and he'd come down there and he smacked him upside the head so hard he thought he fell out of a tree. And, you know, and you'd have all these things. And I thought, this is what speaks to me. Yeah. And then when I read the introduction to Wolf's Head, where it talks about him saying, I, I did work of my choosing, and I didn't have some son of a bitch standing over me telling me what to do. And when I read that, that his quote, and I'm slightly off, but that's pretty much what he said, I thought, yeah, I get that. I not only get the rhythms of the storytelling, but I get that, that sense of independence. So for me, this is the appeal, and I think it's very much out of the Texas tradition. Yes. Because people who would, would scoff at literature were great storytellers. And the kind of storytelling he goes back to goes all the way back to the caves when people were sitting around, you know, talking about... Uh, that they had trouble with uh, the the big dog that day that attacked them and right. whatever. So, and I think that that's his secret. Yeah, the rhythm thing is why 
Why are more people in Texas attuned? Why are more people in Texas attuned to Because Robert E. Howard's work is identified as fantasy. And a lot of just pure Texas people, and that's changing because the, the dynamics are, but growing up in the past, the they were ashamed of, of fantasy, pulse. not just the pulse. Not just the pulse, but the fact that it was that made up stuff, like they'd been telling the truth. <laughs> but 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 it was that there's that made up stuff where he's got a sword in there and a dragon. Yeah. And they didn't and they couldn't get that. My mother could never get that. But the other she part all the things back, all the things Booth Ruth and all yeah. that. But she could never get it. Well, you know, the other thing is it's not just that. It's because Howard has never been promoted until recently as a Texas writer. And most people know Howard's creations and they see his influences every day and the fact that he has influenced If you see George R. R. Martin's uh, Game of Thrones or you read the books, that's the, he's not, that's not Tolkien. That's a natural extension of what Howard was doing. It's more complex. It's probably more literary oriented, but it comes from the Howard tradition, not the Tolkien tradition. Yeah. So these echoes go on and on. But He's not promoted that way. And Robert E. Howard didn't promote it so much as Conan is promoted. So Conan is known. You walk into anybody, you say Conan, there's hardly anybody that doesn't know who Conan the Barbarian is. Yeah. But they have no idea who Howard is. And that's because it's up to us to start making people identify in the same way that Jack London, because he's kind of the Jack London of Texas, I think. I, I think Again, I think Jack London was a better writer in some ways. But he had the, and he had the storytelling rhythm too, but he's no better a storyteller overall than Howard. And so we ourselves have got to make sure that people understand that this is a Texas writer, and Texas writer or not, this is a writer of importance and impact that has changed the world of literature. Yeah. E even if you want to say it's the left-handed side of literature, in the introduction to his book, I said it, his stamp should be on the left side of the envelope. And a lot of people says, no, his stamp's going on the right side. You missed the point. <laughs> the, the point is it goes here because he may be the left side of, of it, but there's a left and a right to everything. Yeah. And here is a guy whose impact is probably as big as Hemingway's ever was, or if close anyway. Hemingway changed the way people wrote, but Howard changed what people saw yeah. and what people read. And the, and, and the pop cultural echoes that have gone on, not just in the generations of, <laughs> not just writers, but also artists that were influenced yes. by Howard. Howard was such a visual writer. Um, you know, everybody, the, the, the people that, that were uh, authors, or that there were artists for, for Howard, were inspired by his works. But if you, if you consider that the Conan stories were one of the primary ingredients in Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, you People who've never read Howard are getting Howard. That's right. That, that's right. And and from Dungeons and Dragons, we go to the current computer game industry, this billion plus dollar industry, which is based on the role playing games, which is all based on the Robert E. Howard stuff. And so it's uh, there. There's he shows up in weird places. You know the 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 meanness and the the conniving, backstabbing, corrupted civilization stuff that's in Game of Thrones. Yeah. That's all that's all Howard, man. That's Howard minus the barbarian in the room. <laughs> but but it's happening though, and just to just to take a few points of happiness, is that not long ago, uh, Lovecraft was recognized by Penguin. And you think this is a little thing, but this is this is a major thing. Edgar Rice Burroughs, H. P. Lovecraft, and Robert E. Howard have done the one thing that really defines what literature is. They've lasted. They not only lasted, but they continue to be read. Now, you know, you can argue who you like best, and I like a lot of different writers for different things. But Burroughs also, without without a Burroughs, there's no Howard, and there's yeah. this echo that runs. And then to some extent, uh, you know, Lovecraft and and, and Bard. I mean, excuse me, Howard borrowed a lot from Lovecraft, and things, but he had a way of looking at it, going back to that storytelling thing. So now he's been accepted into this Penguin group, and you're starting to see references to him popping up where never before would you. You might hear Conan the Barbarian, but now it's like Robert E. Howard. And one of the things that helps this, and I think it's a sad thing, is his tragic death. As more and more people know about that, they become more interested in him. The film, Whole Wide World, a few years ago, brought it up a notch. It's happening. We just got to keep the pressure on. <laughs> fellas, foundation fellas, you got anything you want to throw in on here? Um, well, I was going to, to your point, Shakespeare was a popular a producer of popular entertainment. Mm -hmm. Dickens was a producer of popular entertainment. Howard 
was a producer of popular entertainment. And when you look at his impact, as you said, it goes way beyond just the pulps and the, and the Howard stories. It goes into the other kinds of media and so forth. So the influence is very, very pervasive in the culture. And popular culture is starting to be more academically accepted. You guys are going out there and pushing that. It's been a, things too. Been, been it's up to name, but is that people really talk about your students don't know that I teach don't know what I'm talking about. They've never heard of him that day. But Robert, they haven't heard of anybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, that, I, yeah that's no kind of yardstick these days. They've they've heard of Snooky. <laughs> yeah. You know. uh, they've heard of they watch they watch Hillbilly hand fishing, but they don't <laughs> they don't know anything well, about it. Now you're not gonna come down on Hillbilly hand no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. He's just jealous. He can't I, <laughs> Actually I was always too chicken to do that. Yeah, I, I, the last uh, thing I wanna do is put my arm up the mouth of a flat head. I was gonna add earlier to the point about the rhythm, um, I think some of you know I've, I've, my contribution has been mostly in editing and trying to re get back to Howard's text as opposed to the people who edited it heavily. And one thing I discovered very early on was that Sprague de Camp, who was a very good, elegant, mannered writer, put too damn many commas in a Robert E. Howard sentence. And he slowed him down. Howard was an oral storyteller. And that, that yeah, I get, that, I get that comma argument from my editor from time to time. And, and I just say, that's not the way it's read. That's yeah. not the way it's done. It's not about where grammar is, is accepted. Yeah. It's about where story is accepted. Don't read it. Listen to it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, don't you think, uh, because when you read Howard, it actually rolls like a movie? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I think, I think that, that one of the things that makes Howard or Hemingway or those writers so special is that they're so cinematic. And I think that so many, and I think writers should be influenced by everything around them. I don't think you should write a book that would that would just be a movie, but I think you can write a book that could be a movie. Yeah. And I, I think that when Howard, what makes it even more, I think what makes him so interesting to me is that the pervasiveness of film was not common then. Certainly film existed, but you know, it wasn't, it didn't have the impact on literature as much then. You know, my generation growing up was the first uh, television generation, really. And so like, I was born in 51, so in the four, like, late 40s is when television really came in and when they started bringing in all these shows, Flash Gordon, <coughs> Buck Rogers, and these old serials and, and uh, all of the cartoons and stuff. So our generation grew up on that with comic books beside it, and yet we were still being fed literature at the same time. So yeah. you got this whole different group of people. Now these people are like old guys like me, and I teach at the university, and actually, I, my people I talk to, they usually do know who Robert E. Howard is, which always surprises me when I yeah. in classes. They, they'll surprise me, though, that not know who, uh, you know, Richard Matheson is or, or sometimes right. even Steinbeck, but they know who Robert E. Howard is. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. have a little different take on this cinematic idea, though. If you closely read Howard, you find that he does not give you detailed descriptions of anything. Right. He leaves it to your he, he leaves it to But you. that's the cinema. And that's the mm -hmm. cinema part, but it's in yeah. your head. Yeah. And that's why... We can disagree. Howard fans are famous for disagreeing with each other vehemently about that isn't what it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> Howard was not a cinematic. He's a participatory writer. You join him in the act of creation. But see, I think that's I think that's what makes people think. It's what the point I was trying to make is what makes people think that he's cinematic is that he has the knack to turn the switch on in your head that you produce that yourself. That's what I mean. Is that it's what he left out. Right. Mm -hmm. That mattered because, uh, I mean, Hemingway used to say that he would write stuff and then take it out because people would sense it was there and all you saw was the tip of the iceberg. Well, obviously, Howard's a much more, you get to see more of the iceberg. But, yeah. but the point is, is that the, he did choose very cinematic scenes and words, though. Some of the, uh, I think sometimes he overwrites, but there, you can say the same thing about Lovecraft, but you, there's some writers that can get away with doing it wrong because they've made it right. And these guys, he was one of them. And what he did was that he, he made these imagery, that made the, he picked this imagery up, and then, like you said, he would have all this stuff that's really not there, and you'll go back, and or this battle scene that went, oh my God, it must have went on for 30 pages. No, it didn't. <laughs> yeah. But in your head, it did. Yeah. yeah. He, um, that's I, what I mean by cinematic writing. You, th you think Lovecraft overrun? <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. Skosh. <laughs>